on military units result from due regard obligations. And the second panel, um, after a break, a coffee break, uh, we will focus on limitations on military users that are not attached to due regard obligations. With regards to the first aspect, which um, we begin with, let me introduce the participants of our panel. Yoannis Prezas, who is an assistant professor in this university, will explain how the rights of the coastal state in its uh, economic exclusive zone constitute by themselves a limit to the military activities of the states. Then, Jean-Pierre Bastille-Biodo, emeritus professor in this university also, will talk about us about the respect of other rights states as a limitation of military units in the uh, EEZ. And finally, Pierre Boussard, Deputy Director of Legal Affairs of the French Foreign Ministry of Foreign Affairs, will react to these interventions, discuss them with the contributors, before wider extenders with the topic. We are late already, a little bit. So I will ask both speakers to be um, kind to respect a time limit that should not exceed 20 minutes. So um, a debate uh, can actually take place uh, with uh, uh, the book. I give the floor to my colleague, Yohannis Kazas. Thank you very much, Rafael. Imagine a bigger and very beautiful park filled with gardens and uh, small lakes and uh, all kinds of trees and flowers. There are squirrels, lakes and birds singing all around. So this place, this park, used to be part of the public domain. But uh, Mr. Smith, who was living next to the park for many years, managed somehow to lease it from the state. In the contract, Mr. Smith uh, was uh, entitled uh, to the exclusive uh, use uh, of the resources in the park and uh, he uh, also had the uh, duty to protect the wildlife. But uh, there is a condition. All other citizens would continue to enjoy free access to this park and in particular all other citizens, as in the past, uh, would uh, engage in whatever recreation activity they choose there in the park. So one day Mr. Smith sees Mrs. Jones practicing archery near a lake. Archery. So Mr. Smith goes to, to her and in an angry tone tells her that archery is not permitted in the park because first of all this is an activity that could uh, threaten its safety and then because uh, it's an activity uh, that uh, risks harming, causing harm to the wildlife or even other citizens. So unless the specific authorization given here by him, only he could give her this, uh, this authorization, this activity is working. Ms. Jones retorts that uh, in any case, since she takes all necessary precautions to avoid targeting squirrels or birds or even Mr. Smith himself, she adds ironically, there is nothing in the contract, in the lease or in the law in general, prohibiting archery as a recreational activity in the park. So Mr. Smith uh, uh, brings the case to court, and yeah, the problem is how the judge should resolve this uh, imaginary dispute. Actually, this imaginary dispute is not very different from uh, reality because the problem of the military activities in the exclusive economic zone is uh, quite similar. The problem is that uh, uh, there was uh, a controversy on this issue, uh, the question of whether and to what extent other states
state, other than a coastal state, could engage in military, uh, conduct military operations in the exclusive economic zone. So for some states, coastal states, uh, there should be uh, a condition prior consent. So all uh, military activities should uh, be conducted with prior consent of the coastal state. For military powers, on the other hand, uh, these uh, freedoms were part of the high seas, so the new regime of the exclusive economic zone could uh, not uh, have affected these uh, freedoms in the exclusive economic zone precisely. The problem is that uh, neither of the sides could uh, pass a provision recognizing uh, its position, so in the Convention there is no specific provision dealing uh, with the question of whether and to, to what extent uh, the um, third state may conduct uh, military operations in the exclusive economic zone. This is not a theoretical question because, as already mentioned, there have been some incidents uh, involving mainly China and the US in the field of uh, the problem of aerial surveillance, in other words, spying. So the Chinese uh, consider that these activities are not permitted uh, because uh, there is no basis in the Convention. For the US, these activities uh, are part of the ISIS freedoms. Uh, and here, the freedom of overflight. So, uh, uh, before dealing with this question, a uh, brief remark about the concept of military operations. Uh, there are some kinds of military operations that I don't understand, they're not military, but uh, uh, without being exhaustive, military operations cover, first of all, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance operations, to put it bluntly, spying. Second, military marine data collection and oceanographic surveys. Third, military, military maneuvers and exercises. I think there is a difference between exercises and maneuvers, but I don't know uh, <laughs> what is exactly this difference. And fourth, testing and the use of weapons. Subject to the prohibition of the use of force, all these activities are in principle permitted in the high seas. But the problem is that in the exclusive economic zone, we don't know. We don't know exactly, that's why there are many diverging uh, uh, positions on this issue. I would like to focus my presentation on two issues. The first one is that of the applicability of due regard, because this applicability presupposes the existence of rights. And that's a question uh, uh, mentioned, the uh, problem mentioned earlier, uh, the difference between violating sovereign rights and uh, the obligation of due regard. So, in order to establish the applicability of due regard, we must uh, identify the conflicting, potentially conflicting rights of the coastal states and of other states. That's the first point. It, uh, the second uh, problem is that even uh, if we manage to identify different rights in conflict, different rights, not the same right, uh, the operation of due regard uh, is uh, somewhat somehow difficult, but uh, we had the opportunity to, to see uh, some of the aspects of uh, the duty of pure regard this morning. So the first point, point is the applicability of pure regard. The question is, are military activities permitted in the exclusive economic zone in abstract in general? That's the first question. A logical reading of the convention would imply that pure regard applies only to potentially conflicting rights that are attributed by the Convention to the coastal state or to other states. In that sense, the applicability of due regard presupposes clearly the existence of a right to conduct military operations in the exclusive economic zone. The real and preliminary question, because there is no specific provision on that issue, is whether uh, it therefore uh, to establish the existence of such rights. And uh, as a uh, we shall see here uh, uh, there are pardon, uh, there are some uh, I continue to uh, to have friends inside me uh, there are um, there are several arguments not always internally coherent uh, put forward to defeat the claim that third states enjoy the right to conduct military activities in the exclusive economic zone of the coastal uh, state. First, there are many arguments, and in the 
the vast body of the literature, these arguments are, are not clearly articulated. There are many contradictions, but I will present you in uh, brief uh, these arguments. The first argument is uh, uh, the fact that some activities in the exclusive economic zone fall within the jurisdiction of the control state. That would exclude the foreign military activities in the same field. One example is this of marine scientific research already mentioned. For the Americans, when a military vessel collects naval uh, ocean, oceanographic uh, data, this is not marine scientific research. For the Chinese, uh, this is marine scientific research for which uh, a foreign state must obtain consent. It's a matter of interpretation. I'm, I'm not able to, uh, uh, to say that the US or the Chinese are right, but uh, it's a matter of interpretation. In any case, this argument comes from Article 56. There is a right of the coastal state. If we consider that this right covers all aspects of the activity, military and foreign military activities in this field, the same field, are excluded. That's the first argument. But there are other arguments. The second, as some coastal states uh, uh, claimed uh, during the negotiations and after, uh, the Convention does not recognize military operations in the exclusive economic zone because these operations are not linked to the freedoms of overflight and navigation. Because as you know already, Article 58 uh, talks about uh, uh, overflight and navigation, but there is no specific provision. So, for some coastal states, these activities are not prohibited, and that means that these activities must uh, be conducted with the prior consent of the coastal states. For maritime powers, these activities are permitted because of, in customary law, which uh, have been, uh, have been uh, in, uh, in a way transposed in the Convention, in the Exclusive Economic Zone, all these activities are permitted. Uh, this is a matter of interpretation too, and uh, of interpretation of Article 58. Here, it's not Article 56, it's Article 58. And uh, there is a third and a fourth uh, argument. Uh, I'm trying to go from uh, the more specific to the more general. Uh, in conjunction with the second argument, beyond the economic rights,